I'm Paul Mason. I'm Kate Rayworth. And we're going to have a conversation uh, for the next 20 minutes, half an hour, about our books and our ideas. Um, and we're on the most annoying chairs for TV journalists that exist, <laughs> never give anybody one. So and we've never met before and we've never talked before. So we have this slightly once. Well, yeah, but, yeah. but we never talked before about books. No, we so. haven't. All right, so I'm going to start by asking you. Um, the donut yeah. in donut economics, the outer sphere is what the planet can, 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 can bear yeah. and the inner sphere is what society... You explain to me. Just yeah. explain your idea. Because I've never met you before, and I've read your book, but I've never met you. So please, can you explain to me your idea, and then I'll... Okay, imagine a donut, a hole in the middle. The hole is where people are falling short on the essentials of life, so you want to get everybody out of the hole. People having enough resources to have food, healthcare, education, housing, we call it human rights, and we've got 70 years of humanity agreeing on what those essentials are. So everybody over the inner circle, but... Earth system science for the last 10 years has told us, hang on a minute, there's an outer circle on this. We cannot overshoot because there we begin to kick the planet out of kilter, causing climate change, ocean acidification, hole in the ozone layer. So it changes the shape of progress from the 20th century, this ever rising line of growth and GDP growth that is progress to, no, progress is about meeting the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And it's a very different project for the 21st century. Right. And so, so I'm, my background, although you know, post-capitalism, the book I've written, is not a Marxist book. It is it rooted in some of those traditions. And the problem with that, as the same as with um, mainstream economics, is it tended to see the Earth as an unlimited resource, not because they were stupid enough to think that the Earth was an unlimited resource, but because they ex expected productivity and technological change to constantly bring the, you know, as human activity pushes at the edge, as you so brilliantly describe it in that metaphor or that graphic, they expected technological change to pull it back. Okay, so what should we do? If we accept your, your thesis, what, if you just take one segment of your, your donut, what should, give an example of what you think we should do. So I don't want to go at it segment by segment because I think, so I studied economics at university 25 years ago and was so frustrated I walked away from it. Because if I wanted to talk about the degradation of the living world, if I wanted to talk about climate change, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, air pollution, I was offered two words, mm. environmental externalities. And right there, an alarm bell goes off. Mm. If we're talking about the breakdown of the planetary home on which we depend as an externality, you already know there's something wrong with your theory. Yep. So I walked away from it. I want to be part of the movement that's rewriting economics so it's actually fit for the 21st century. So I want to put hence the donut, put the living planet back at our understanding, heart of our understanding of, it, of human well-being. But I want to think about design principles that we put at the heart of everything. And I, for me, there's two, regenerative and distributive design. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something about regenerative, because I know, because what I love about the overlap in our books, your network and hierarchy, to me, that's what I talk about, distributive design. Mm. So, and I'm going to just use this, this network. I think the 20th century was dominated by centralized technologies. Like Can everyone see this? Hold it up a bit. Centralized technologies and centralized institutions. So in the sphere of energy, think of oil rigs, coal mines, and gas pipelines. Uh, in the sphere of business, think of the shareholder-owned corporation. So that's a technology and an institution that we designed, and they're centralized. But this century, we can be distributed by design. So energy, if you look at the renewable energy system, it looks like that from space. It's decentralized, distributed solar power, solar panel on the roof of every house or a wind turbine scattered across the fields. It wants to be distributed by design. Information, 20th century, you had to go through the operator board and out to somebody else. 21st century, the internet. It wants to be distributed by design. And what, what, even though these things are being captured at the moment, what fascinates me is that for the first time in human history, the central technologies of how we generate and distribute energy, how we generate and distribute ideas, are distributive by design that's never happened before. So can we harness that opportunity? Does it have to be captured in the way it's being captured? What do you think? Well, so where I came, it's interesting that we're both um, fascinated by, revolted by the term externalities, because uh, you know, my job was to cover economics. And uh, you know, obviously, you, you run into the idea of the, the 
as networked economic, as the economics of networked systems became obvious, what people began to reach for was the idea of the externality. So we're all used in economics to negative externalities. You know, the 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 the, the power station pollutes your washing. It should be charged a tax and etc. Ronald Coase. And then we realized that networks create positive externalities. And it, we had suddenly more than faxes and phones to go on. We had networks. Um, now, to me, my project begins from this, that, that information technology for now, for now, is very good at creating networked externalities, networked effects, positive effects. All people tweeting or talking online about this very discussion will be creating a cloud of information that is neither owned by you nor by me, nor necessarily has to be owned by anybody, but just right now is being owned by Mark Zuckerberg and, uh, and Twitter. Okay, so my thesis, the, the thesis of post-capitalism, one segment of it is that there is no need for those networked externalities to be captured by the market. And in fact, better that they are not captured by the market and that the route to, so, so we might have a disagreement about what abundance might be because, because people on my side of the argument have been very neg negligent about understanding environmental limits. Uh, but I do think there is a route one towards abundance which, is, which consists of demarketizing the exploitation of networked externalities and the price destruction effects, which have been well documented by business gurus like Jeremy Rifkin, zero marginal cost effect. Um, the networked externalities don't belong in the market. The really, really interesting thing I want to share with you is that in the work I've been doing around my current journalism and my next book is how many people in the tech industry say, say it, Paul, because if I say it, my share price tanks, but I believe it. And that's why I think that maybe some secretly people sitting in the audience might even be those people, that if the tech industry admits what is wrong, it'll be as, or rather what is dysfunctional, it'll be as big as if the oil industry admitted you can't go on extracting carbon from the planet. What do you think of that? What is it they want you to say that they say they can't What say? I just said, the, there's a zero marginal cost effect. Okay, Most okay. things will, uh, should be cheap or free. Network tech technology should not be owned by corporations. Corporations are killing innovation. Corporations are, are, uh, are scorpions stinging themselves. And people at the top of some of them actually realize this. And we who have freedom, they don't have, they're the least free people on the planet. We who have the freedom to speak, I think, need to begin a debate about how we restructure the, the economy and the institutions of capitalism to unleash the real potential of information technology, which I believe is to transcend the capitalist social form that, we, that it originally developed within. I totally agree with that. Good. Because I think, I think, you know, look to nature. She's been thriving for 3.8 billion years, so pretty good example to learn from if we want to stick around like she does. Nature works in ecosystems. Nature takes resources and breaks them back down into cellulose and chitin and lignin and keratin and builds new things. Nature has ecosystems of mutuality. So I like just to start by thinking what kind of economic institutions and structures would enable humanity to create ecosystems of economies, not that centralizing, yeah. which it, it centralizes accumulation, creates huge inequality, but actually is distributive by design. And it is not the 20th century yeah. institutions of capitalism. And that's where it gets really exciting. We should say that this amazing thing that is a great illustrating device for a, for, for, um, a hierarchical system and a network to, and, and, and a distributed network is not been built by MIT for your uh, purposes, has it? It's been built for... It's from a toy shop. It's from a toy shop. So, um, the, I am, so I was going to say famous, notorious for, notable for, within, so, so where it's common to hear the idea that a transition has begun to post-capitalism and that it can be pursued if we build non-market building blocks in the economy is the peer-to-peer -peer movement, uh, which, um, I, my contribution to this debate is not particularly well liked by that movement because what I say is you are like Richard Arkwright. You are like the person who's built the factory uh, and, and you know, you've got your, your stream pouring into your factory and you've got your lovely workers in their, in their, um, in their dormitory. And, and I want to be uh, the state. 
I want to say you've, the, the, what makes this happen, even if it happens in its distributed form, and, sometimes, and, and I, I even more heretically say it might not need to, in some instances be in a distributed from below, highly networked system. But suppose it does, the state has to enable it. So what's the practical consequences, if I may ask, for a state that read your book and understands what you're saying and sees this and goes, wow, what are the practical consequences? Where does the state start, given that the only people who understand what's really going on are the people on the nodes of the network and they're very disempowered, what, 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 should we, what, what should a state do? So for me, I, and I'm agreeing with you here, so I, again, I'm going to go back to where economics begins. Lecture 101, supply and demand, as if to say the economy is the market. And that's, where, that's why we talk about externalities, because anything that falls outside the market contract becomes an externality, right? And then sometimes there are market failures. Oh, we might need a state, but the state might be a bit incompetent. Yeah. So, there's, so it's the last 30, 40 years of economics has been markets are first best, states might need to step in, but they're not very good. So the real self-hating state, and we've lived through Thatcherism, Reaganism, which is all the self-hating state. I think the work of Mariana Mazzucato really brings back, hang on, actually, the state can often be the risk taker, it can be the leader, it's crucial. So I think of the economy having four key ways of provisioning. First place is where we all begin every day, the household, unpaid caring work, women's work, that's feminist economics. Don't forget that, it's what makes labor reproduce for work every day. Yes, there's the market and there's the state and there's the commons. Mm. And you're calling it peer-to-peer -peer, and I, I call it commons, but they're deeply, deeply connected. These are four ways we provision every day for our wants and needs. So what's the role of the state? I think the first role of the state is to recognize that not only is it providing public goods, it needs to create space that protects both the household and the commons from encroachment by the market because we've lived through massive encroachment by the market on both of those. And, and I think... Um, the, the only category, the, the, the category simplification I've made uh, as I've been in, in, sort yep. of pursuing the explanation of, of my book is, in to, is to say, really, for me, there's the market, the state and the non-market, which would include, in, in, include reproductive labor and includes the commas, includes, you know, also includes leisure. Now, what, for me, the transition, I'm interested in metrics. I'm interested because I want to do this in in providing a plan, but also a measurement for whether we've succeeded. And for me, this is what led me to um, revive and try and refine the so-called labor theory of value. And for me, what does, what does um, because even now people come up to me and say, like literally professors of economics in Vienna, I did a lecture in Vienna, and the guy said to me, what do you mean about the non-economic? You know, everything's either economic or it's irrelevant. You know, and that's what marginalism economics, marginalist economics says. There is nothing that is not, that if it's not scarce, it's not economic. So, so when people say, well, what should we do? One thing I say to them is we should create a ministry or an office of the non-market economy, which it should do two things. It should measure the commons and, the, and leisure, and it should measure reproductive labor. And there are arguments about wh how we incorporate re reproductive labor into a new bargain. Um, and then its purpose should be to move, basically in terms of labor hours, more human activity in terms of pure abstract labor hours out of the market and state into the non-market. Now, that's, I should probably say, I like the idea of socializing domestic and reproductive labor as much as possible, although there's an argument about that. But so that's my thing. That's my framework. And in case people are thinking, what on earth is this bullshit leading to? So I think it's entirely possible that I can persuade Labour to have an office of the non-market. You're talking economy. about Labour the party. The Labour party mm -hmm. uh, to have an office of the non-market economy. And of course, we both know, and the audience knows, all over Europe and in some some parts of Latin America and even America, there are now cities that are building in these kinds of models to actual policy. Mm -hmm. I've been recently, I was in uh, the city of Ghent in Belgium, uh, meeting local officials from, who work for the city and say, our job is to enable the commons and to enable commoners in our city to create a thriving state. And I was like, I have never heard a city official talk yeah. like that. And, he, and the lovely thing he said was, well, I'm also a citizen. I may be an employee of the state. I'm also a citizen here. And he recognized the value of the commons and they've got a really rich 
commons. They, you've got many, Michelle Bowens did this analysis in Ghent saying there's over 500 institutions that you would say were created by the commons. And let's just be clear, the commons where people come together, not through the market mechanism, not under state, but co-creating goods and services they value. It can be a, a garden on the corner of your neighborhood block. It can be a local association. It can be a, a sports club. But these are places where commoners meet. Now, when I say things like that, uh, what the objection, because I'm really lucky to be able to interface with classic business audiences. About one time in four, it misfires, like it's a, a, a bunch of investors and they literally go, fucking hell, you know, what is he on about? But sometimes it's not, they don't, especially at the C-suite level, people actually do understand this. However, what they often really say in response to, you know, to that is, A, it doesn't scale, and B, show me something spectacular. Because I think, for example, Wikipedia is spectacular. Uh, and Linux is spectacular. But in their spectacularity, something that you will know from the environmental movement, really they answer the question, you know, a tree doesn't ask itself, how big do I want to be? A tree says, how, where am I going? And what's the sort of general sort of, where do I get to in my tree life? And I think Wikipedia and Linux and Apache uh, have kind of done that. Uh, and I find that spectacular, but businesses, C-suite people, don't. What they want to know, how does Wikipedia scale? Um, and the answer might not be, might be, it, it, it doesn't. It's a tree. It's grown there, you know. Well, so the internet is spectacular. And the internet, of course, was built on the fact that people who created its platform did it free open source. So all the businesses that build on it, thank you very much. Every C-suite is filled with ladies and gentlemen who have been toilet trained by their mothers. That's spectacular as well, actually. And, and without that unpaid caring work, businesses wouldn't run very well. But I want to say that trees don't try to scale forever. What trees do is spread. They spread their seeds. And these technologies aren't designed. It's, it's a very, I think it's a very 20th century expansionist cumulative idea that what a business has to do is get bigger. We need to scale. No, we need to spread. And actually, little things are popping up all over. And what I love about the seeds of the new economy that I see everywhere is that they're everywhere. I see it popping up all over. And, and the logic of commons organizing, the logic of peer-to-peer -peer is in every country. It's spread, not scale. It's a completely different way of thinking. We both write about human transitions. I, I hint on it. I mean, there's one, there's one chapter in my book about, about climate change, and everybody slags up that, it, me off for that. But I actually, I actually say in it, you know, I don't need to write a, clim, a, a, a chapter about climate change because there is, so, there is so much other expertise in the study of climate change. Even the ICCC itself, IPCC itself, it, it's, it's there. But I do think there's a sort of where the lacuna is in a lot of left or radical thinking about alternative economic models is what's the relationship between human change and institutional change? And what do you think about that? Well, I'm right in the middle of a very vicious blog debate with um, a former leading economist at the World Bank, Branko Milanovic, who's telling me that humanity is just we're so far gone into capitalism, and I'm going to pose this back to you. We're so far gone into capitalism that we're just driven by self-interest alone. And so even if there were other possible traits in our nature, we're driven by self-interest. We're driven by the desire to accumulate income. So there's no hope for regaining these other traits that may have once been in humanity. What it's interesting, say? isn't it? What I would say to that, first of all, a theme that I'm kind of writing more and more about, which will drive a lot of people absolutely mad, I hope, is that um, in 302, Diocletian decreed that Christians would be basically killed, right? Christians. And, and a few were killed, you know, a few hundred. And uh, the sort of general old Marxist view of that was too little, too late. Uh, you know, but, um, but, but, but what I think now is that uh, by 40 years later, Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire, certainly by 50 years later. Uh, we, I grew up, uh, what I'm trying to say is, I grew up in a society which was, because it's working class and affluent working class, yeah, I, because of the post-war boom, I think was full of very different moral values. And I, for the like it or not, I carry those around with me, just like my toilet training. So when uh, complete, um, you know, one-sided thinkers, whether it's Milanovic or even more me neoliberal thinkers say, humanity is acquisitive, competitive, uh, meritocratic. I say, that cannot be true because I grew up in a completely different society. Now, it may be that that's the, one di the direction it's going, but for me, it, I fear, feel that this 30 years of neoliberal backstabbing Ayn Randianism is a little bit like Diocletian's 
failed attempt to stop Christianity. That actually, why are people here? Because they want something better than that. And, and they're not, I, most people, I think, are not in this room for a transactional reason. We'll pay you later. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the format isn't Q&A, otherwise we could not bring you all in. But what, right, where are we going? We've, we've got a bit left, haven't we? Um, what do you I, I feel profoundly that there is a far richer version of humanity that I see every day in the street, uh, in the news, uh, which is desperately reasserting itself. And it lives in the commons and it lives in people who are advocates of public housing or who are advocates of free and open source software who are trying. I can't actually see you there. Can you come over here? I can't. How long have we got? Two minutes. Two minutes. Whatever you need. I, I, I see the full richness of humanity desperate to reassert itself. And that's why we're getting the rise of the commons. We're not just labor and consumer, which is what the market tells. I've even got rational economic man here, right? This is the 20th century depiction of humanity. Rational economic man, he's a man standing alone, money in his hand, ego in his heart, calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. It is the most absurdly narrow version of us because actually when we think of the commons, we are collaborators, sharers, carers, neighbors, stewards. And that's when we get excited because we are homo ludus, we are creative. And so when we put that back at the heart of the econ economy, then the kinds of institutions that bring us alive in that way are in the commons. And I, and I would agree with that. And what, the, the one thing I would say though, is that history is a journey. And once something's happened, it, you, it, you rarely back out of it. Now, I think what the young people I speak to and sometimes even teach uh, in the most bizarre circumstances uh, the, 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 have two traits at the moment. Uh, one is this incredible focus on the self. So, the, you know, talking to students two nights ago, what's the most, what, what can we write a play about? What can we work on? It, it, transgender, uh, fine, you know, and then me too, fine, good. Um, what else do you know about what's going on? Nothing. You know, real, I'm sorry, I'm not caricaturing, nothing. Uh, Black Lives Matter, yes. But what about Trump, not interested? Korea, not interested? Uh, now, I think that I grew up in a world that would see that as a weakness, but I now see it as a strength because the irreducibility of do not fuck with me, do not, do not touch me, do not step into my space is a really good um, irreducible a kind of I am Spartacus kind of emotion uh, that you can build on. Uh, and, and I am not so down as Milanovic and, and other people. If indeed, young, we, are, we can't, you, you know, Manuel Castell says you can't de-electrify a country. You can't de-network individuals. That's probably right. And you can't de-individualize But can society. you decapitalize them? Yes, I think we can. You can have the last word, otherwise, because I had the first So word. I love you said, you know, there's this generation who've got this very strong sense of don't fuck with me, don't step over my boundaries. I wish we could just give that same recognition to Mother Earth. Like, right? Don't screw up my climate. Don't screw my water systems. Protect, give, recognize my boundaries. <laughs> recognize kind of my boundaries. And then perhaps we could figure out, and that's exactly what the donut does. Don't mess with people's claims to the basics of life and don't screw up the planet. And perhaps then we've got a space we can live together. Kate Redworth, Paul Mason. Paul Mason. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.